Grace, mercy, and peace be yours in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for today's message is taken from our Old Testament lesson. I read again Ruth 1, verse 5. And both Mahlon and Chilion died, so that the women, woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Here is the reading of our text. May God add his blessing to the reading of this word. Amen. Of course, our gospel lesson was the healing of those ten lepers, right? And the one comes back and thanks Jesus. And Jesus says to him, Rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. This is a terribly misunderstood passage in many parts of our country today, where people use it to teach us that somehow Christians should never get sick. And if they do happen to get sick, then they should snap back in a heartbeat. And that if you actually spend any time in a hospital, your faith is deficient. I even heard one person tell a paraplegic because this faith healer was not able to heal the paraplegic. He said, quote, and this is burned in my memory, you may as well hang it up as a Christian because you don't have enough faith to be healed, end quote. Such a horrible thing, such an unchristian thing to say. This saying by Jesus is misunderstood, not only, not only this saying, but others that have sort of a similar kind of a feel. For example, in Matthew 18, Jesus says, Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. And this quote has been used to prove that if you want a Cadillac, just get a couple of others. Christians to join you in prayer and by gum God has to give you a Cadillac. Do you want to have a pay raise? Get a couple of Christians together with you and you can get that pay raise. Do you want to have a bigger church? Get a couple of Christians together with you and pray for it and by gum you start your building program right away. What of course is ignored is that Jesus in this context isn't talking about a sugar daddy God he is talking about forgiveness. And he is saying where the absolution is given, like we do on a communion Sunday, and forgiveness is there. Because we have two or three gathered and say, your sins are forgiven, right? But these sort of passages get so twisted around that I wanted to talk about them. And Ruth gives me a wonderful example out of the Old Testament to talk about this and what true faith is and what the blessings of God truly are. Now, just a couple of back, a little bit of background. We're dealing with the end of the age of the judges. So we're dealing around 1100 BC, give or take, you know, a couple of decades. Naomi is from the word that means pleasant or delightful, or lovely. It is an adjective that is used in the Psalms talking about God. It is also used about talking about God's blessings for the people. Things have turned around for her when she gets back into Bethlehem a decade after her, her sojourn in Moab. She has changed her name to Mara, which means bitter. So that gives you a feeling for how her life has turned around. Then we have Ruth. And the name Ruth is not quite as, as well known as for its meaning, but it probably means something like saturated, a drink to one's fill. So it's kind of a feeling of abundance. You've got more than enough. And uh, so, you know, when... Naomi gets back and she says, my life is bitter. I've lost all the stuff that God has given me. But then she has this woman of abundance with her. Now the story is set up by a famine, right? Now let's pause just for a minute. 
It says famine in Bethlehem. Are we going to say that nobody in Bethlehem had faith in Jesus? That all these people that were just somehow bereft of their knowledge of God? Or was that famine there in spite of the fact that they were believers? In fact, that the famine came perhaps specifically so Naomi and her husband would take a sojourn in Moab so that Ruth would become part of the Holy Family. And these trials and tribulations came as a result of God's faithfulness. If the prayer can avert all disaster from a human point of view, why did that famine come? Naomi and Elimelech go to Moab. Now we should know something about Moab here. This is a neighboring country. Moabites were prohibited by law. Coming down from the days of Moses of becoming part of the promised people. That is because even though that they were relatives of sorts, when they had left Israel, I mean Egypt, and journeyed to the promised land, Moab had opposed them, sent their mo armies out, and they had to go around Moab. And, and so that was it. They said, that's it. You will never share in these promises. And yet, where does Elimelech go with his wife? To this forbidden people. And who does her son marry? Forbidden women, right? Oprah and Ruth were Moabites. They weren't supposed to become believers. And yet they did. What do we learn? Through this hardship, we have learned that the gospel of God's love is always stronger than the law. The law says if you sin, you shall die. And we're not just talking about temporal death. We're talking about eternal death. Now, how, like, show of hands here, quick. How many people have sinned at least once in their life? <laughs> okay. Okay. So are you trusting that God's gospel, his message of salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, is stronger than the law? Or do you believe you're going to hell? A quick show of hands of everybody who thinks they're going to hell. Sorry. <laughs> How many people are trusting in Jesus Christ as their Savior? Yeah. Because the gospel is stronger than the law. And we see that in Ruth's coming to faith. Anyways, as they, uh, Ruth and they, uh, as Naomi is in Moab, they have good times, don't they? After all, there were a couple of weddings, right? How many people think weddings are, are a sad time? There are happy times. So they had some good times in there. But then the bad times start coming, don't they? Her husband died. Both her sons die. Life has taken a bitter, bitter turn. So what happened? Has Naomi lost faith? Has she somehow abandoned God and her trust in God? Is that the picture that you get of Naomi throughout the book of Ruth? That she is somehow this hardened apostate sinner? No. Her faith remains strong. In fact, it is the witness of her faith in the true God that has brought Ruth to faith. When she is saying, go back to your people and your gods. And Ruth is thinking, you've got to be kidding me. Why would I go back to those lifeless hunks of rock when I could be with you and be with a living God? When I could be with you and be with a God who hears prayers? When I could be with you and be with a God who promises eternal life? So she clings to Naomi because Naomi's faith was strong in the hard times. Now, some people think hard times reflect a lack of faith. Somehow they think if you are 
A true believer, you should live your life in a constant gravy train. And so perhaps Naomi was struggling. But Naomi was, is not the only example of people from the Bible who have hard times not and, and still are, are faithful people. She's not the only example where hard times actually come to people even because they are faithful. For example, uh, Israel, when the famine struck during the times of Elijah. Elijah suffered through that famine just like everybody else. Are we going to say that Elijah wasn't faithful? Or we think of the Israelites who spent 400 years in Egypt as slaves. Are we going to say that Joseph and his family were not faithful? And all their ancestors weren't faithful? In fact, there wasn't a faithful Israeli, Israelite until Moses rolled along. His mom wasn't even faithful and so forth and so on. Well, there were plenty of faithful believers in God during those 400 years. Uh, what about when Jezebel had to run from, uh, I mean, when Elijah had to run from Jezebel? Are we saying that Elijah had, uh, was no longer a faithful prophet? It seems like God was ignoring these people. What about John the Baptist? We all know how he ended his ministry in prison and then being beheaded. Are we going to say that God, that John the Baptist lacked faith? What about the early Christians that were thrown to the lions? Holding on to their faith, what a tremendous witness. But are we going to all of a sudden say they lacked faith because they weren't delivered from the mouths of the lions and instead went on to lead long and happy lives with big paychecks and so forth and so on. What about all those Christians that Stalin slaughtered or Mao slaughtered? Are we going to say they really weren't Christians because they died in purges and, and persecutions and holocausts and all that kind of stuff? What about the Christians that are over in those ISIS-controlled countries today? that are having their heads lopped off because they won't deny Jesus. Are we going to say that God is not interested in them, that God doesn't care about them, that they aren't faithful or something like that? It doesn't make sense, biblically speaking, to say that if your faith is strong enough, you are going to live on a gravy train throughout this life. The church, the true church, the Bible has never taught that. It has never lived that as an example. Sure, you can pull out some people that had it good. Abraham, he had a great life for the most part. I mean, yes, he lived in exile and all that kind of stuff, but he was a well-off man. But for every Abraham, I can give you five Josephs sitting in prison for years and years, falsely accused. Have you also ever felt like this? Have you felt like your prayers are being ignored? Have you ever felt like you were looking at the backside of God, that when you came to him, he turned away? It is far more common than we would like to admit in our experience, is it not? And then if you go to one of these churches, they're telling you, like they told that friend of mine, you may as well hang it up as a Christian because you don't have enough faith to cure your cancer, because you don't have enough faith to get the IRS off your tail or whatever it may be. Don't listen to those false prophets. When you feel this way, like you're facing the back of God, you are actually in good company. A company like Job. You all remember the story of Job, right? Here he is doing fine, doing great. And then his crops are wiped out, his cattle are wiped out, his children all die. And the only one left is his wife. And I'm not so sure that she was all that much of a comfort to him during those hard times. And yet, 
in spite of all of this, in spite of all the evidence that might be cited by these uh, health and prosperity people that would say uh, otherwise, Job holds on to his faith. What about, uh, mm, what about me losing my place? Okay, what about uh, Noah? Noah on the ark, praying. A year. That's a long time, right? Forty years in the wilderness, Israel is wandering and praying. Forty, a whole generation is dying out there. It certainly would have seemed like they were praying to the back of God. What about the 70 years that they spent in exile in Babylon? Again, they would be saying, Lord, why don't you deliver us? In fact, we've got some wonderful psalms about, uh, written by the Jews when they were in Babylonian captivity, asking that very question, why have you ignored us? Because it is not just the experience of the Jews in Babylon, but it is the experience of the church throughout time. For every example of God answering a prayer quickly, like, say, David versus Goliath. Okay, that was a quick answer, right? Uh, with an affirmative answer, the answer we wanted, right? There is another example where the prayer was not answered the way the prayee was expecting and not in a timely fashion, at least from the point of view of the prayee. Ruth and Naomi pray. How long was Naomi in Moab? A decade. Ten years. That's a long time. Have any of you ever prayed for something for ten years? All she wanted to do was to go home. All she wanted to do was see her family again. But the famine was there, and so she was left to pray. And then those things that brought her joy in Moab, her husband, her boy, dead. And apparently, no grandchildren. No source of comfort. So even when she does go back to Bethlehem, she is not going back in a good situation. Because widows with no male children had no real visible means of support. And her companion, Ruth, was a Moabitess. She had no rights at all in that culture. Foreigner. Gleaning. It sounds very charming, doesn't it? We see these wonderful pictures. You know what that was? That was their welfare system. That was her only source of food. And you go and you get what you can that the professional harvesters miss. And so you see in, in her story those little instructions where Boaz says, pull off a little extra and toss it out there for, for the gal to find. She was just helping the poor. People misunderstand these passages when they think that this is some sort of punitive uh, action by God. God is not punishing people there for a lack of faith. In fact, it is quite the opposite. Their faith is very strong. Because to hold on to your faith during dark times is far more difficult than to hold on to your faith during good times. Is it easier to believe that God is good when you have a loving spouse, loving children that are all graduated from college and have wonderful jobs and married wonderful people and they have given you wonderful grandchildren and you live in a wonderful house in a wonderful community with a wonderful government and somebody says, boy, God has been good to us and you say, yeah, that makes sense, right? But what if you live in India's destitute poor people area? And somebody says, God has been good to you. Which takes more faith to believe? 
when you're living in those destitute areas? Absolutely. Or when you're facing something as gruesome as the cross that Jesus faced. And what does Jesus say on the cross? Has he lost his faith? My God, my God, he calls to our Lord. And then later on he says, Father, forgive them. Even in that hour of death, in that hour of greatest tribulation, Jesus demonstrates the true nature of faith, which is to trust in things hoped for. It is to have a conviction in things not seen. Noah's faith was seen when he was building the ark. And all those people gathered around and ridiculed him. Not when he stepped off of the ark and everything he believed had been proven true. Israel's faith was seen when they were slaves, not when they were celebrating on the other side of the Red Sea. David's faith was seen when he trusted the Lord, even though Saul was hunting him down, not when he was being crowned king. Okay, yeah, a little bit when he's being crowned king, a little bit when they're dancing on the other side of the Red Sea, a little bit when when Abraham, and not Abraham, when Noah is making the sacrifice after he gets off of the ark. But the big show of faith was when things looked hopeless, and yet they trusted. Then there are the great, uh, then aside from these things, there's the greatest trials that we face. Death, and not just our death, but the death of loved ones. Those are really dark times. And they also prove how these passages I mentioned earlier are clearly misunderstood. If it was true that all you had to do was pray and have faith and all of your illnesses would be taken care of, if that was true, right? In my book that has all of the occasional services, there would be no funeral services. Every Christian would still be alive because their sicknesses would always be healed, right? But there is a funeral service in my occasional service book, my agenda, because Christianity does not guarantee that we will miss the sting of death here. But we push on. And so let us push on with the story of Ruth and Naomi. Beyond today's reading, after they returned to their, their life in Bethlehem, as I said, they had troubles because Ruth was that Moabitess and so forth and so on. As they were gleaning, uh, you know, the women were at risk, but God continues to watch over them. And Ruth and Naomi's story turns out nice from a human point of view, doesn't it? I mean, Ruth marries Boaz. Naomi gets her grandchild. How many people have grandchildren? Aren't they great? Aren't they great? I love grandchildren. Okay, they're, they're a blast. And Naomi gets that. And her life has become well. But we are mistaken if we think that that is the point of the story. Stick with God and everything will finally turn out well in this life. That didn't work for John the Baptist. It didn't work for Stephen, the first martyr. It didn't work for Isaiah, who died in exile in, in Egypt, and so many others. The ultimate treasure, the ultimate reward, is not a fat checking account. It is a place in eternity because of your faith in Christ who has faced death and all sorts of things for us. For Ruth and Naomi, the more comfortable life was not their ultimate reward. Nor, might I say, is Ruth being the ancestor of King David the ultimate reward. Her great reward came in eternity, and her great place in history comes as the ancestor of Jesus. Now, 
I said her great reward comes when she dies and she goes into the presence of God. But that is really not the full picture, okay? It's more of a foretaste of her great reward because her great reward and the great reward of every Christian is comes on the last day with the resurrection of the body when Christ comes as judge and we all know that the, the sheep on the left and the sheep on the right, those on the right are those who have had faith in Christ and enter into God's eternal presence and the one on the left are those who have rejected God and rejected Christ and go into eternal damnation. But on that last day, everybody is raised physically. It's like uh, what Job said, I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself. My eyes shall behold, and not another. My heart faints within me. On that last day, we are raised physically. Those who, have lack, uh, <coughs> those who lack the faith of Ruth will go to hell where they will be cut off from God for all eternity. That is from all good. A place where there is no laughter, no songs, no friendship, no love, no compassion, no hope, or any other good thing that God gives. For those <coughs> who repent of their sins and trust in Jesus, we will stand with Job and Ruth and Naomi and Boaz and all the saints and be judged to be justified, righteous, children of God, citizens of glory, all because of what Christ has done for us. So it is clear that God takes a long view when he hears our prayers. And trust me, he does hear our prayer. <clears throat> he responds not just with our immediate need in my, my, mind, bleh, but with what will strengthen our faith. And not just our faith, but also will strengthen the faith of those who are around us. And not only just strengthening the faith of those who are around us, but also what will be a larger witness for his church. Just as Ruth went through a lot of trials, I mean, Naomi went through a lot of trials, and through that witness, Ruth came to faith. Just as Isaiah was exiled down into Egypt, and through that exile, who knows how many people came to know the true Lord. Just as Jonah, for example, was sent on a boat. And what happened? Do you remember after they threw Jonah in the water and he got swallowed by the great fish? What happened on the boat? The sailors glorified the true God. And then when he gets to Nineveh and he preaches, what happens in Nineveh? The people glorified God. This is how God is answering prayers even if it's not necessarily exactly how we want it. You all know John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This is the love with which God hears our prayers and answers them. He still loves the world. He still desires everybody to be saved. And so... And it's with this expansive love that God hears our prayers. It's with this expansive love in mind that we offer our prayers. We remember that he answers our prayers for our eternal good. To give faith, to strengthen our faith, and to have our faith reach out into the world. Amen. May the peace of God which passes all human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.